Okay, this is uh, lesson 79 and here we're looking at the subject managing change. Now this is for the new AQA syllabus but I'm also using this particular lecture for the old AQA syllabus as, as well and it's about the subject managing, managing change. Now the big thing here is this subject has been really really beefed up. So we're going to start off with a theme called Lewin's model, Lewin's forces model. But we'll be looking at that in a second, but just first of all, we're just going to go through the reasons why we have change and then how can we affect change in a very, very basic format, barriers to change, and then we're going to have a look at Lewin's model on here. Okay, so we start off with here with the causes of change. Well, the causes of change could be technology. And obviously, if you're in a high-tech industry, you've got to change very, very quickly. We spend a lot of time on this. We go through Apple, Samsung, Nokia, and this big battle between the two. At the moment, Apple is winning, but Samsung have come out with a, a cheaper version of the iPhone, and then Nokia are coming back with an even cheaper version of their iPhone. Uh, we'll also look at Cobra, who also, used, who also used technology to brew their beer twice. And then we've got Tata JLR. Tata brought out JLR and they brought, them up, they brought them out for a couple of reasons. Because they wanted to build a great big brand through uh, the Tata Jaguar Land Rover range, but also because they want to tap into the creativity and the engineering skills of British industry. Down here we've got the macroeconomic conditions. Obviously the big one was in 2008 with a massive recession. Therefore various companies took off like Primark, Domino's and Ryanair. Primarily, maybe they had a negative income elasticity of demand. Maybe there were industries characterised by a high price elasticity of demand. Legislation, we're going to leave at the moment. But what I could say there is obviously the big issue right now is climate change. So therefore, any firm that can cut down their emissions is going to be on to winner. And finally, we're looking at competitors' actions. So if we take Tesco's, they've been taken to the cleaners a little bit recently by Aldi and Lidl. So we're having a look at all those reasons why change might take place. So therefore, fundamental to any firm is the idea of managing change. Now, fundamentally, you concentrate, what you should do is, first of all, the leader should come in, so the leadership plays a very, very important role in all of this, is the leader should create a vision for that organisation going forward. Therefore, all the workers will become inspired by that vision. They'll all go out and work really hard, and hence everything will be okay. But that process is a really, really difficult thing to change. So you've got to concentrate on the positive aspects of the business, you've got to obtain the full commitment to the people involved, you've got to communicate that vision, you've got to offer people incentives, training programs, participation, and perhaps it's also going to be part of your big corporate plan. So in very simple terms, this is how you can one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, including the vision. That's how you can effect change on here. Okay. The barriers to change is people don't want to change and people don't want people want to return to the old ways because that's the ways that they know and understand and there may well be a lack of belief in that change. So the next lectures, the next series of videos 79 to 81 is all about the changing process and the first one we're going to have a look at is Lewin's model. Thank you. Uh, it's now really, really cold and I've got a blocked up nose and it's, and it's coming up to Christmas, but let's just go through this particular one on here. So this is lesson 79 and we're still looking at uh, the process of managing change. And here we have Lewin's model here. We have the forces for change and the forces resisting change, the driving forces that would enable you to create that change and the restraining forces. Maybe there's not enough money within the firm or whatever. Now, when you look at this model, you need to investigate the balance of power. Right, who has the power within the organisation? Who are the key stakeholders within the organisation? You need to identify the opponents and the allies of change and how to influence the target groups. So these are always all the, these are all factors that you need to do when you're looking at change. From here, internally or external factors, could the business do better? Could the business make more money? Is that a marketing issue? Could the business become more efficient? Is that an operations management issue? greater flexibility, maybe there's poor demotivation or poor communication within the firm. So therefore you need to get together, use Lewin's model and discuss all of these, all of, all of, all of these things on here. <clears throat> so you can pay a consultant to come into your firm and they'll be looking at the culture of the organisation and deciding how it can move forward. Move forwards. You have external factors for change. Maybe you need to produce greater quality. You have the Apple iPhone, Apple, Samsung, uh, greater competition out there in the marketplace, Toyota, Volkswagen, JLR, 
technological change, that 3D printing, that's going to change the whole manufacturing environment, globalization and scarcity of natural resources. And on top of that, we have climate change legislation and the composition of the workforce. So these are all factors that firms will need to, need to take into account why they need to change, but they use Lewis models. It's a bit like a SWOT analysis on, on, on a firm. You sit down and you look at how your particular firm can change and how it's going to move forwards. And having, you know, I'm now 51 years old and I know that people are incredibly difficult to, to handle and to deal with when you're trying to implement change, take it from me. Anyway, so this is Lewis model and how you implement change. Lesson 79 and managing change. So, so far we, we've, we've looked at the basics of managing change, about how we can do it, have a vision, communicate all the time, train people up. Then we, then we had a look at Lewin's force field analysis, which is quite a useful model to deciding what are the restraining forces in an organization, what are the driving forces to create that change. And then we sort of go, now we're going to go back a step, how we manage that whole process and why that whole process may need to be managed in the first place. Well, first of all, then we're going, to look, we're going to have a quick look at mergers. And in this case, it is uh, firms may grow through internal growth or they may also grow through mergers. Now, obviously, if you grow through mergers, it's going to be a little bit quicker than trying to grow internally all of the time. So you just take over a, another great big large organization. Now, firms want to become bigger, but why do they want to be, become bigger in the first place? Because you're going to achieve economies of scale, you're going to get more power. It's going to stop your firm from threatened of being taken over by someone else and it's going to give your firm more status and it's what people want to do they want to make firms even bigger and bigger and bigger you can have internal growth or you can have external growth now on here therefore tata jlr when tata took over jlr that was just a bargain of the century it was a really really good move by tata but but in terms of the cultural change they left jlr largely as as it was so therefore it was a successful process it was a very successful process of managing change so it's a slow pro process process it kept jaguar land Rover fairly similar in terms of what they did and and its structure and they've also invested very heavily in JLR, so therefore the workers are also going to be on board. Uh, therefore, this is a classic case of all the stakeholders are happy. Tata are happy, the shareholders are happy, uh, JLR are, are, are obviously going to be happy as well. So all of those different segments, and including the UK government and indeed the Indian government. The reason why I'm quite keen on looking at all of this is I'm going to, going to have a look at UK manufacturing and one of the success stories of UK manufacturing has obviously been Jaguar Land Rover and therefore why has that company been a success. Now we've got some horizontal integration here, a classic case of something that fell was Daimler Chrysler. Chrysler was characterised by an entrepreneurial culture. Daimler was German, which was characterised by a methodical culture and the two cultures clashed, so therefore it never really worked. But firms may also decide to join up because of revenue synergies, e.g. Volkswagen Skoda. Now, Volkswagen is a German company. Skoda was a Czechoslovakian company. Uh, Volkswagen's got a lot of expertise, so it used that expertise to improve Skoda. Skoda probably wouldn't have survived under the old Czech system. Now it's, going, it's doing really, really well, and it's got its own sort of status. We see Skoda as a different type of car to Volkswagen. It's a slightly cheaper, more rugged version of that. And it's doing really, really well in, in China. A vertical backwards organization. Well, you could argue that Tata JLR is a horizontal, horizontal integration because Tata also produces cars in India. And obviously JLR produces the Jaguar Land Rover quite clearly. But it may also, Tata also produces steel. Steel is used in cars. So they've got more of that process involved. If they then also own the dealerships, then you've got complete integration throughout the whole system. Uh, and also conglomerate, or conglomerate integration, that's when you move into a completely different industry. So once again, you could argue that Tata JLR was moving into a completely, completely different industry, which is probably going to be diversification, which according to Ansos Matrix is the riskiest thing to do. So you move to a different industry. Why would you want to do that? It's because that industry may have very high market growth, e.g. cars in the emerging markets. There's a massive market out there. So the Jaguar Land Rover has quickly become a star. They've got high market share, but also they've got high market growth in that country. Average rates of growth of 7 or 8% in China right now.
So you may also have conglomerate growth where you move into, into something completely different. It spreads the risk. It allows a firm to have a wider portfolio, can move into fast moving industry and the benefits of synergy. However, of course, it may be the case that your firm doesn't really understand that industry. Now, that's a major drawback. But clearly, Tata JLR has been a great success in terms of what it's done. And there are other examples of firms that move into any industry that, that, that's going. The classic case of that would be Virgin. It doesn't always succeed, but it has got 360 companies and all works under the Virgin brand. So there you go. That is the picture of managing change as relation to this bit, part of the course. Okay, so here we're still looking at Lesson 79 and the Managing Change section or module, and here we're looking at the corporate plan, and the corporate plan sets out what a firm wants to do in the future, its aims, objectives. I always quite like to see it as a, as a, as a business plan. So a new business starts up, what they're going to do is they're going to create a business plan, and the, and the business plan will, will have forecasted profit and loss accounts. But for a firm that's already in existence, the big thing that will have in it is the overall objectives of the firm. You know, does it want to move into a new market, but also the strategies involved to be used to achieve those objectives and also the firm's tactics. Now, it's going to get that from a SWOT analysis. But also, obviously, if you have a corporate plan, uh, that's all going to be part of the managing change process because you've got to tell people what's going on. So corporate plan will also contain the vision that will tell the workers what's happening within, within, within the company. Now, there are also factors that will influence a corporate plan. Obviously, the internal factors will be uh, the financial resources, how much money has the firm got, the operations management side of the firm, the skills, the management, the human resources, and the whole culture of the organisation. And once again, the external factors will depend upon political factors, technology, what the competitors are up to, and social trends within the environment. So it's really anything that is an external factor. For, for instance, macro conditions, you're talking about the 2008 recession. change section and on, on, on this section we looked at how do you manage change, you create a vision, you train people up, you communicate at all times. Then we looked at Lewin's uh, force field analysis whereby we looked at uh, the, the sort of things the, the sort of things that you need to look at in terms of enabling change but also the forces against the change. And then we sort of look at the managing change process itself and corporate plans and why do firms want to grow and everything like that. And here we're still on corporate plans. And the, the value of a corporate plan is it sets out the key objectives of a firm and communicates to all its stakeholders. So, for example, the workers, they'll be interested in their jobs. The banks will be interested in the firm's gearing and how the firm's going to increase its profitability. And the shareholders want profit. So you write a corporate plan and it tells you what what you're going to be doing in the future so therefore hopefully you will raise money. Now part of that corporate plan may well be a contingency plan. A contingency plan is what are you going to do in a risky, what are you going to do when a crisis occurs? So you plan for a crisis. Now one of the disadvantages of having a contingency plan is why don't you just avoid the disaster in the first place? Fair enough. Uh, but you write a plan if something's going to go wrong. So, for example, where would have corporate plans have come in over the last 10, 15 years? So, for instance, in the credit country in 2008, Cobra Beer was doing incredibly well, but had a cash flow problem and was therefore taken over by another company, even though they're built for a great brand. RBS went bust because they didn't see a credit crunch coming. They were expanding rapidly. They were going for growth. They were trying to be the biggest bank in the world. Therefore, eventually, really, they went, they went under. They didn't go under because they're bailed out by the government, but they would have gone under. Ryanair is another example of a, a firm that did well out of the credit crunch, but did they really change anything? But, or, or was it just because they have that cost minimization strategy? Something else that might change is oil. So the price of oil was $40 a barrel in 2007. I think in 2009 it went up to $140 a barrel, and now it's gone down again to $70 a, a barrel. But basically, firms should know that the price of oil is probably going to go up, particularly over the longer term. So GM and Chrysler didn't really adapt to the new marketplace. They didn't produce a car that did lots of miles to, to the gallon, so they were caught out. Whereas a Nissan Leaf, which is the first ever electric car, 
one of the first electric cars on, on the market with the idea that if the price of oil continued to rise that they were going to be able to dominate that to dominate that market. It's sort of, it's been a partial success, the Nissan Leaf, but it was probably a risk worth taking in terms of that. Social trends, obviously corporate social responsibility, Unilever taking up big time. Technology, which we'll be talking about later, but there's a massive example there in 3D, 3D printing, insuring, all the changes that are going to take place in manufacturing are pretty massive. And that's going to have a massive impact on, on firms all over the world. So, the advantages and there are disadvantages of all these things of sorry advantages disadvantages of having a contingency plan okay the advantages it reassures customers about what's going to happen and that, that you have a plan and it also allows the firm uh, to rapidly respond to a disaster the disadvantage obviously of a contingency plan is that it's going to take time and money to write and why not avoid the disaster in, in, in the first place. But all of this is all part of the managing change process. You will write a corporate plan to tell all your stakeholders what's going on within that firm. In a sense, what you're doing is selling them the vision and the practicalities of how you're going to achieve your objectives in the, in the future. Okay, thank you.